He said, uh, we're going to move right along into our next panel. Telemedicine has long been suggested as a cost-efficient way to provide medical care for people with limited access to health professionals. But the benefits may lie in the significant savings it brings thanks to low overhead costs. Let's dive deep into the evolution of telehealth and what's in store for the industry in our next panel discussion. This topic is the evolution of telehealth moving beyond... FaceTime with the doctor. To ensure that we make the most of this session, we have Timothy Washburn, CEO and founder of TSW Consulting and MLLC, as the session's moderator. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Timothy. Oh, okay, small change. Okay, Suba will be uh, moderating it. We'll take it away then. Let me step down. Continuing on that same topic of how digital health drives healthcare outcomes, I think we're going to focus on this session. Uh, I would like to introduce the, the panel. Uh, come on in. Um, I wanted to uh, give me one second here. So um, I want to give a background about myself, which I gave in the previous session. Uh, my name is Sup. I am a, a healthcare technology evangelist, a futurist. Uh, for 30 years, I've been in technology field and healthcare technology, uh, working for the top five insurance companies in the, in the U.S., uh, Cigna, Anthem, and others. And um, my uh, passion is my heart is technology, my mind is business, and my soul is food. That's the best way I describe myself. So with that, I am going to uh, bring on the uh, table. We already have here uh, Tim uh, joined our panel. Alan, please join the panel. And I uh, will have them introduce their uh, background and their company as they come on in. And finally, here we have Anthony. Come on in the stage. Thank you. And uh, let's, uh, I think we want to give a little focus on what this session is about. So we're going to focus on how telehealth has evolved in the last 100 years or 200 years, as you would call it. Telephones didn't exist before. How that is actually driving the change in the primary care and the value-based care world. And uh, with that said, I think it's, it's good to kind of like get a stage of uh, what this uh, telehealth, uh, uh, how telehealth drives the primary care change and value-based care change to the end. In the first and foremost, I want to have each one of the candidates introduce themselves, please. He said he'd turn on, so I'll try that again. My name's Tim Washburn. I'm a registered nurse, currently doing case management, been in nursing for 30 years, done a lot of different things, run clinics, started my own business for network consulting, uh, health technology management, and partner with another group that's really focused on value-based management, and I really appreciate being here, so thank you. Thanks. My name is Alan Preston, and I've been in the uh, healthcare arena for quite some time as well, over 30 plus years. I started off running HMOs, and then um, then I also did a little stint running a uh, physician uh, practice, which we grew to a number of different markets, and ended up being one of the larger ones in San Antonio, Texas. And then from there, I ended up doing my own company where we did clinical drug trials all over the United States. And now I'm back in the managed care side running an accountable care organization in Houston. And we manage about 100,000 members. And just by way of academic background, I'm an epidemiologist and biostatistician, doctor of science from Tulane University, which uh, <laughs> uh, our moderator also went to. So FYI. Nice. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's, it's wonderful to be a part of here. Um, I guess I'm the odd man out. I'm not. On the healthcare side, I mean, since we, we started Echo about six years, that's my kind of first foray into healthcare prior to that. I've purely been in technology. My uh, graduate degrees in computational learning theory, which is like a kind of discrete subset of artificial intelligence, and you know, had the opportunity to, uh, to partner in order to build this organization that basically you know, DECO brings technology together with physical medicine on site. So really looking forward to this panel. Wonderful. Maybe uh, about your company, uh, you want to mention about uh, your company as well, what you guys do? Sure, yeah. I mean, you know, DACO, we're a little bit about six and a half years old. We're probably the nation's largest fully mobile medical provider. Does that mean? That means that we bring health care to people where they need it, when they need it. So all the health care that happens outside of a fixed four walls of a, a traditional health care institution, 
That's what we do. That's what we really do, whether it's in the home or a homeless shelter, whether it's at your employer's office or it's in the back of one of our mobile, urgent, and primary care clinics. We bring care where it's most accessible and at an affordable price for everybody at all socioeconomic statuses. It's really where we focus. We went public on the NASDAQ about a year ago. We just had about our one year uh, anniversary there. We've got about, you know, a little less than 5,000 employees, and we, uh, we operate in about 27 states, the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. Great. Uh, I think we want to just set the stage about telehealth. I think every one of us know what telehealth is. I think the recent three years, uh, we've already also experienced. While the telehealth is, is a term uh, evolved around the 1970s with the telephonic world, American Telemedicine Association was formed. Uh, the key was that using telephones to help prisoners. Uh, Dr. Jay Sanders is the founder of American Telemedicine Association. I think he put the context very nicely. What is telehealth? I mean, people keep asking, okay, if I see the doctor over my phone, is that telehealth, right? So on the context of it, the best way to describe the telehealth, why that is going to change the primary care is this. Dr. Jay Sanders puts it. Typically in the olden days, in the 1800s, right, doctors, you know, each family had a family doctor. They knew everything about the family. They came home. They gave a house visit. There was a house call doctor. I think in the 30s, the healthcare uh, organizations involved were private and pri uh, private, public, and uh, uh, national health insurance came about. That the care was always when you go to the doctor. Technology was the best in the doctor's office. Technology was there in the hospital. So everybody went to the doctor's office, they went to the hospital because that's where the best technology was. As the 30 year evolution of emerging technologies, like the technology at a consumer end or a patient end today is much more sophisticated or equal as the one you can get in the hospital. So the idea behind this is that when you want to measure a patient's vital signs, we go to the doctor, a good example he gives is the blood pressure. Right? So we go to the doctor's office and uh, well, anxiety, anxiety comes in, you're stressed out, doctor measures you, and your blood pressure is high, and they start treating you. Typically, when you're at home, you're perfectly fine. Another example is a kid who has an asthma condition. They go to the doctor's office, they test the pulmonary function, the doctor's hospital, uh, office. That's not where the kid lives. The kid lives at home. So the whole idea of the telehealth, what it does is that it brings in the patients where they are, brings them in the environment where they are, and the doctors and physicians are able to examine them and consult with them in the environment where they live. So I think that's a good context to understand that, right? So with that, I want to kind of get into the meat of the uh, uh, topic. Why suddenly so much of adaptation of telehealth has come in? The last 30 years had major impact. Evolution of technology, and then healthcare reform, and then the pandemic. I call these a trifecta. The trifecta has really forced us to come to this kind of stage where we are at. So pandemic and telehealth adaptation has brought us to where we are today. Now we go back to, you know, um, um, as an ecosystem, I mentioned in the previous session, if you were uh, sitting in here, a patient says, you know, doctor in my pocket, nurse in my purse, therapist in my jacket, pharmacist in my fingertips, and the clinic in the GPS. Now, that brings in the comprehensive aspect of the telehealth. Now, first question I want to put present to you three uh, are how, how have you seen the telehealth impact the urgent care and hospitalization? Well, I, I mean, I actually, I lost my, my speaker again. I don't know, maybe I'm sitting on it. We'll try this, I'll lean forward. So I think the first thing we have to recognize is the culture has changed. So the pandemic forced something that was already started. How many here want to go to the doctor's office sitting next to the five other sick people and wait for two hours? Anybody? <laughs> You're sure that's included? That's included in, if you want it. So I think the culture has changed. I think the pandemic is really forced in understanding that doing the right care at the right place has to be understood through their cultural context of what people actually want. People don't engage in healthcare just because they're sick, although that happens too much. You as an HMO director, you deal with that all the time. How do you engage folks in a way that is actually interesting and relevant? You're not gonna do that in the traditional ways alone. Telehealth, I just saw a survey come out and they said, 
doctors are saying they're going to cut back on telehealth. And it was a big surprise. We think that's because they don't understand telehealth. This is a really good topic. Telehealth is about adding value from the patient's perspective. Urgent cares, people go there because they can go in and get seen. At the end of the day, urgent cares we work with now have scheduled slots because they recognize that's what people want. So I think telehealth, urgent care, even emergent care, this is a patient choice. I think payers, healthcare providers, we kind of have to catch up because they're going to vote with their feet, and they already do. So that's the biggest change I've seen, the biggest impact I've seen in those settings. Yeah, and I, I think it's a, it's a question oftentimes, is it a complementary benefit or a substitutive benefit? Mm -hmm. and, and it's emergent. So right now, I think it is what I would consider to be more complementary in that it, it does a couple things. One is it allows the patient, if you will, for sort of lower level types of episodic kind of care to, to be managed in many cases more effectively than having to wait a week or two or a month in order to get a slot at the doctor to be seen for something that could be uh, managed rather simple and, and, and quickly. I, I think the challenge, uh, and I think one of the ways that the industry is sort of trying to manage the challenge is, uh, you know, if you're in the provider community, of course the question always is, well, how do I get reimbursed for a telehealth medicine consult versus a in-house medicine consult. And, and so value-based care is one of those components where uh, physicians oftentimes now, particularly in the primary care setting, are able to uh, achieve more dollars on the back end uh, to the extent they do the right thing. Now, what do I mean by the right thing? They achieve certain results, and some of those results are measured by what we call HEDIS indicators in the value-based care, such as high pl blood pressure, some of the things that you were talking about, um, uh, type 2 diabetes. So a lot of these things can be monitored at home and, and can be um, effectively managed in a telehealth setting, setting, which helps, one, the patient achieve a good result and frees up the doctor's time to be able to, to do the more complex care management inside their office. So I think that that's one of the things that's happening is that you have to give the providers a economic incentive to want to move toward this continuum where it makes sense for them as well. Yeah, I I think we step further and maybe challenge the notion that telehealth, to point by itself, the telehealth by itself is is as disruptive maybe as people tend to believe. I think that it, it comes up short, and that's why a lot of doctors are trying to draw back on it because so often, when you have a telehealth consult, it ends up resulting in a physical visit anyways. Right, you need labs, you need prescription, you need additional diagnostics. And so as the result of that, you just ask yourself, well, why didn't I just go in anyways? Why even have the telehealth visit? You know, one of the key things that we focus on and what I think is going to be a big differentiator is the combination of the two, the ability to bring in a lower level provider on site without having to steal the time of that PCP or that subspecialist or the DR doc, without having to spe uh, steal their time to physically go on site, but having them the ability to telehealth in, but with somebody physically present that can be the arms, the ears, the eyes of that clinician. I think that when you bring the two together, you have a truly disruptive and differentiating healthcare model, which not only creates more accessibility, but will improve better patient outcomes, but the, the fact that telehealth by itself is going to really dramatically improve the way that we work in our healthcare society, I think is a bit overstated. I think it's a great point. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the key point is this, telehealth enables physicians to be able to do affordability and accessibility of the patients, vice versa, right? It allows them remote patients. Some people have to travel 200 miles to see the specialist doctor, right? And some people have to travel 50 miles just to get the primary care. So I think that drives and it, it changes. It, it helps them to, to have that accessibility and the affordability of that, of the healthcare uh, uh, experts. Uh, adding to that, though, uh, the first point I mentioned was that in the past, there was no data for the doctors. As you said, you have to go back to the doctor's office to get the vital signs anyway. So as I sit in here, I'm telling you, uh, the, the watch and the patch I'm wearing is measuring more vital signs than what ICU could provide. Literally, the, 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 the physicians today, as the technology drives this world, can actually get the vital signs. 
now with the, you know, everyone is familiar with the Uber Eats, what, uh, what the pandemic did to food industry, right? So now literally buying food at home is just common thing, right? Similarly, technology enables that. So very valid point. Today as we see it, that is where it is. But I think the, 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 the future as we merge the digital health tools in the 5P world, uh, I think that that's going to change the, the, the concept. So I want to go to the next uh, question I had in there. So do you guys see that it, the, uh, the private and public uh, health insurers, payers, who have adopted paying for telemedicine visits, is it going to stay? Is it going to move? Is it going to change? Well, I think health, can you turn that again? Can you guys hear me? <laughs> swear to God, I'm not sitting on it intentionally. Yeah. yeah. I'm really not nervous. This is so you can hear me. <laughs> so, you know, I hope it doesn't change, but let's be honest. What do we know about healthcare? It changes. It's going to change. To me, we, we talk about telehealth or brick and mortar health. We talk about public or private. Really, there's a fundamental thing we have to start with access as a patient wants to access healthcare. And by the way, that is not very often how the doctor thinks. Healthcare should be accessed or a payer. Turns out we're all different. There's roughly 300 million different opinions. And if you don't believe that, just look at the two party system. I'm kidding, I'm not gonna get into politics. <laughs> but the other piece is engagement. So even if I have access in a way that I think makes sense, it can take one little kind of bad experience to turn me off from telehealth. I had a bad experience with a nurse on the phone. I'm never doing that again. I waited in my doctor's office for two hours. I'm never doing that again. So access and engagement will drive utilization. That absolutely will drive in the age of consumerism. Everybody in this room votes with their feet on everything in their life. The phone I use, the food I eat, the hotel I stay at, the plane I get on, shoes I wear, and here's the new one. Where, when, and how I get health care. Because it turns out, if I have resources, I have choices. And if I don't have resources, I still have choices. I think that's going to drive that decision and that change more than anything. Great. Uh, going yep. to the, uh, well, sorry, I just, I just wanted to add to that, I, I, because you talked about third-party payers. And, and what I would say is that what, one of the challenges, we talk about telehealth as if it's monolithic, like there's one company. There, is a, there are a lot of different companies out there that provide telehealth services, like Teladoc is a good example. Uh, United Healthcare is, has been trying to make a quasi bid uh, to purchase uh, Teladoc as an example. So that's one platform. There are thousands of different platforms. So one of the challenges when we hear the word telehealth, we think of it as, oh, okay, it's just a patient calling a doctor and they're just consulting back and forth. Not the case. It's far more sophisticated than that. And so one of the challenges is that some third party payers may use, let's say, let's go with Teladoc. Um, and, but the doctor may not be participating with that particular platform, or the consumer may not want to interact with that particular platform. And so, because it's not necessarily their doctor. Yes, they're getting some uh, consult with some party that is in the, in the medical related field, but they don't know that, and oftentimes, the, on, the, on the telemedicine side, on the teledocs, they may not have access to the physician's EHR that had the 15 visits that occurred prior to that one consult. So there are some challenges that have to be uh, sort of addressed and, and, and have to be worked through. And it's, it's not a panacea by any stretch of the imagination, but it is indeed a good step. And, and you talked about like rural health is a great example. Sometimes some people are just so far away that telehealth can make a, a huge difference for a patient getting needed drugs, as an example. Um, that they, that they, it may take them uh, quite a long time to get to a physician and or get the appointment made. Because sometimes it's a 30-day wait for some, some uh, physicians and specialists and what have you. So it, it, it is important, but it's challenging. Uh, on that note, though, it's, it's, it's critical to understand from a pair perspective, the reimbursement. So I don't think there's going to be any change in regards to whether or not it's included. Telehealth will always be included as a benefit for all uh, all plans purely because of the return on investment is always you know so high given the cost is so low. But today, because we're in operating under an emergency order, you're getting full reimbursement for a telehealth visit. You know, when that emergency order changes and you're no longer getting full reimbursement for a telehealth visit, 
the game is going to change quite significantly. You know, if you as a doc no longer can get $90, but you're going to get $25 for your telehealth visit, how many docs are going to be doing telehealth visits, and how many of them are going to be good? Right. Very true. Um, the other question is, there's a lot of discussion about enough, not enough space in the hospital, and we've seen that in the pandemic. How do you see the telehealth impacts that type of challenge which may come across in the future? Well, I mean, you, you know, it's, it's fairly straightforward. If I don't need to go to the hospital, I'm guessing most folks here, unless you work at the hospital, nothing against hospitals, worked in a lot of them, don't go to a hospital to visit unless, well, you have to. I think what you're going to see is telehealth and the ability to have different levels of care being delivered remotely by different levels of providers. The behavioral health um, panel earlier talked about having resources that weren't full-blown psychiatrists but could add value and become sort of that initial or secondary step before you get there. Telehealth is going to be the same thing. It already is. It already is. Uh, really, telehealth is to uh, hospitals like urgent cares are to hospital. What's the difference? Well, in an urgent care, I can walk in. I'm going to have a very high copay. I may or may not get great care, but that's true of any situation. But I can do the telehealth from my own home. So I think it's going to be that preliminary step, and I think the companies that will really distinguish themselves will go beyond the concept of, I do episodic telecare, I do an episodic visit, to really come alongside practices and clinics and be that physician or clinic extender, especially in the value-based space, where there is absolutely reimbursement for specific types of services that, frankly, doctors often don't do, not because they don't see the value. They don't have time. At the end of the day, we, we work with a hospital uh, in Florida. We looked at their primary care visits over a year. When we looked at the documentation 64% of the time, there really wasn't a great justification for that visit. But in other ways, 64% of the time, the patient could have accessed telehealth. And here's the kicker. What we hear from the docs is, I don't have time to see one more patient. Well, what if we did that lower level of care outside of the office to allow time for the more complex care? Hospitals are just another example of that um, situation, in my mind. Yeah, and I think when we talk about telehealth, again, it's, we, we have this sort of myopic view of it. And, and really, what, I think what we're really talking about, if you broaden the view, it's, all, it's almost like this object here. Believe it or not, you can actually call somebody on this. <laughs> I kid you not. It's an odd thing. We, it, you may only do it 1% of the time, but you can actually call someone on this box. And, and I think telehealth is going to be a little bit like that. If you think about the Da Vinci as an example, where you can do robotic surgery, um, there are people that could do uh, robotic surgery if, if there's a Da Vinci, say, in a, in a small little uh, community. Let's say I, I live in Texas in Texas, and someone is in Houston performing the surgery, and, and the patient is 300 miles away. So, you know, is that telehealth? Well, that is, that is actually applying the technology of remote sort of health, and that's what telehealth is. It, it is remote health. And, and, uh, and so, you know, some of the wearables that you talked about, uh, the Da Vinci doing robotic surgery remotely, um, uh, the, the telehealth is, is going to be, a, that is a sort of umbrage word, if you will, that's going to cover quite a variety of things. I mean, nowadays, you had talked about actually when it came out in the 70s, we actually dialed a phone, heaven <laughs> yeah. forbid. I don't think people, nowadays I saw a meme where, where kids were trying to figure out how to do a rotary dial. They couldn't figure it out. <laughs> so um, so it, it, it's evolving and it, and it will evolve. But again, I, it, the question is, is it substitutive or complementary? I think it's in the complementary stage. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for sure, for sure in the complementary stage. I mean, looking at it as an extension, I, I do think that on some of the, the points there in regards to, you know, why is it that we are so episodic? Why are we so treat and release? But why don't we look at patients in a continuum of their life cycle? And sure, what you mentioned earlier about not having a doctor who goes into the home that knows the family, that takes a holistic view of care is one component of it. But the evolution of why that changed is purely because the ratio of doctor to patient is so now out of whack. And so even if you do come up with an incredible amount of technology and even change the incentive structure on a value-based care perspective, 
perspective such that people are not being paid episodically, but they're being paid in outcome-driven approaches, even then I still think that you have a just mathematical disparity between the ratio of higher level independent licensed clinicians <laughs> and patients. You know, the, the average PCPs at, let's say, three to 4,000 patients that they're saying, well, how, how, um, how much time can you spend and you have three to 4,000 patients that you're managing, that's, that's, that's incredible. Now, if you had the ability to delegate that to somebody, um, say a lower level provider, and that lower level provider was in the house and had the relationship with the patient, and they were simply only escalating to the doctor in the event that it warranted that higher level clinician, you know, that, that I think is a model by which the math of the ratio of the number of people to the number of clinicians starts to, starts to make sense. Uh, very, very, very valid, valid point because I think, I don't know how many of you, we know we have about 800,000 physicians practicing with the NPIs today. I would say about a million if you want mm -hmm. those 200,000 folks who are retired. But if you think about it, one million doctors for about 200 million US, 250 million population, including families and children. Um, the ratio is coming you know, down, so that, your point, is very, very valid. With that said, if you think about what telehealth can do, is that data, um, with uh, Alan mentioned, is the physicians now have a historical view of the patient, so the amount of time it might take for them to say, before they even see a telehealth visit patient, they can have a historical view of the data and actually quickly help the patient when they have a telehealth visit, right? So I think the, 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 the point I was trying to make there is that the, the ratio you mentioned from a patient to doctor, I think that is going to stay. I don't think that magically we're going to have 50 million doctors, right, in the next four or five years. So I think technology enables this various levels of triaging, as right. you mentioned, uh, so that the escalated piece goes to the doctor. So there is a early warning sign, right, with all the vitals. Um, early warning sign goes over three, then a, a, a triage nurse can actually work with the patient remotely and stage that situation and hand it off to the patient. So that helps the, in geriatric care, that's really bad because we have about, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, about 2,000 to 5,000 providers. I mean, that's the rough number of geriatric care. But our geriatric population since 2011 uh, has been increasing 10,000 people a day. I mean, 10,000 people are retiring every single day since 2010, the baby boomers. So our population is being shifted to the right as well, where these folks are at home, uh, elderly folks. Uh, and so the, the, the point I was trying to drive back is triaging. Technology helps to triage these things, and then the resources are able to manage the same number of uh, people, right? So um, how does remote patient monitoring change the telehealth equation? That's the next uh, question. Well, I, you know, when you're blind and cold and in the dark, meaning you don't know what's happening, pretty simple outcome, right? All bad. I think RPM and, and similar technology helps provide that extra set of eyes. What I will say is I am a skeptical technologist. I'm a nurse, I'm a practicing nurse. I know there's doctors in this room who are a bit skeptical sometimes too. I think the balance between leveraging technology not to create data overload. I'm sure every doctor here would like to know every normal blood pressure reading on every one of their patients every day, right? That'd be exciting. <laughs> of course it wouldn't be exciting. So I think there's a difference between understanding data for the sake of insight and having data for the sake of checking a box. So, you know, I think RPM will add data if it's well done and you're tracking everything somewhere, right, for audit reasons, mm -hmm. right, but for care reasons, only surfacing what needs to be and being able to tailor that based on the patient and their profile. Turns out, again, not all, all patients are different. Everybody on this panel is different, so are all you. That's going to be the key to making RPM good as it is now, but really great when you combine it with the ability to create the insight and leverage the right resource to manage based on where that patient is through intelligent AI programs. Yeah, and I, I think that it's a lot of this, of course, is how do you apply? What's the application? Uh, because as you say, if you just inundate doctors with a bunch of uh, more data points, that, that forget about it. That's just not going to work. But if you give them the data points when it hits a critical value, and they can act on the critical values, 
and the patient also can act on the critical value. So that way, it's not so wholeheartedly dependent upon one and not the other. Mm -hmm. Because they both have to be interacting with the remote patient monitoring, whatever it might be. And so the idea behind it, obviously, is that let, let's say it's a, a, a blood sugar level or something like now, nowadays you can go, um, uh, Medtronic has, even for type 2 diabetics, a glucose uh, insulin pump that, that helps uh, manage the type 2 diabetics so that their hemoglobin A1C ends up being below 7 and, and manages that quite well. But again, it, I, th I think the, the key is that we have to make sure that, that somewhere in this mix that if it hits a critical value that the patient needs to A, be aware of what that means, and number two, what's the actionable item that they need to do in order to manage their own health care. We, we sometimes think like, like they're somehow out of the picture when it comes to managing health care. You know, they just go to the doctor, the doctor manages it, and they go back home. No, they have to be highly engaged themselves. And I think the fear for providers is they don't mind uh, getting data, but they don't want to just be inundated with data unless there is some critical component upon which they can act on. But then what happens if it happens at 3 o'clock at night? What do they do then? So there's, there are some tricky little uh, areas that they have to kind of navigate through in order to figure that out so that they don't be become held liable by the attorney saying, hey, you should have been up at 3 o'clock in the morning and then managing that patient's critical uh, value thing, that ping, oh, by the way, it was a false positive. Oh, well, too bad, too sad. You know, so there's a lot of those kind of things that have to be uh, worked through. Yeah, yeah, I mean, all really, really good points. The, the reality is that RPM by itself is a very little value, right? RPM needs to be paired with management, right? Usually chronic care management, you know, CCM, PCM. Um, and, and now that's happening because Medicare Institute introduced reimbursement for these, you know, these codes about two years ago, a little under two years ago. There's yes. now reimbursement for those. So you're seeing a large investment going into this area. And I can just tell you how at DocGo we do it right now. You know, it is you're, we're installing the device with the patient, with one of our clinicians in there, let's say home or senior living center, maybe even homeless shelter. And we're installing these devices with them and and just for everybody who's total not maybe not super initiated into the rpm space you know majority of rpm is usually you know blood pressure glucose weight um pulse oximetry um you know that's usually what it it all boils down to and that that data comes to our clinicians in real time 24 7 always monitoring it and you're kind of looking at it from the perspective okay we have like primary preventative care where maybe you're doing something like titrating meds and then you have it from the perspective of like urgent care we're trying to look is there some sort of decompensation where we need to send a uh, one of our nurses immediately on scene one of our critical care nurses on scene to do a treat on scene or potentially you know doctor also runs a transport company so we will transport them in one of our ambulances but when you pair the two together the rpm with the management, with that chronic care management, um, you can then start to really make a big change. I'll give you, an, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, let's take a patient with chronic kidney disease, or even worse, like you know, stage four, stage five chronic kidney disease, and stage renal disease. They have the likelihood of going to the emergency room twice a year, every single year. Well, they're dialyzed almost every other day, right? That's usually how dialysis works. On the days when they're not being dialyzed, uh, they have a very high likelihood of, of decompensating. And so when we monitor them for weight, glucose, because nearly all patients with chronic kidney disease are diabetic, um, and their blood pressure, we can determine whether or not they're having fluid retention. Fluid retention is the key indicator that they're going to have acute kidney failure, and that's the majority of the reason why they get entered uh, into the emergency room. And so by monitoring them, we can know right away, like, hey, we need to send somebody on site right away. We need to do some sort of emergency dialysis, some emergency home dialysis. Or we just simply call them and, and say, you cannot have one ounce of fluid for the rest of the day. The whole rest of the day, you can't drink one ounce of fluid because if you do, the likelihood of you going into acute kidney failure is so high. That has very meaningful, measurable impact in reducing the rates of hospital readmissions for that kidney disease population. Yeah, I think that, that actually adds more value on the type of care we talked about, right? My paper visit, so doctors, PPVR, paper visit. Whenever you are sick, you're a patient, you cough, you go to the doctor. You get your insurance to pay for it, verify. Doctor prescribed medication, you go. The, the, the case you're mentioning is that they are at home in their livelihood, remotely being monitored for their vital <laughs> signs, and one of those things trigger, and then the alert is given to the patient saying that, you know, this is a behavioral change for you, right? So to, to help them, you know, to put it mildly, we are the CEO of our own data, <laughs> our own health. So 
by giving the fact, the data to the patient, uh, it really helps to have them tend to the behavioral change. But it does go to the point of technology. It's, this is probably the area where technology is the most important because there is so much data. There's such an incredible amount of data that's coming in that if you don't properly leverage AI in order to filter out the signal from the noise, yes. then all of a sudden you're inundated and you become numb. You know, and obviously no pro provider, no, no you know, PCP, no subspecialist is going to want all that data put into their EHR. Um, so the ability for AI to really determine what is the baseline and what is an elevation above that baseline, that's one of the rare, very concrete material use cases of AI that can have immediate benefits. Yeah, I think that brings down to a very good point. I'm looking at the time as well. What's the next Big, big step in telehealth innovation. And then we all see the technology evolving. We're consumers consuming things every day. I mean, who would have thought, like, you know, seven years, seven years ago, if somebody told you you could watch two million uh, movies wherever you are in high definition quality, you wouldn't have believed that, right? The technology is driving that change. So what are, you, what, what are your thoughts on the next step in the telehealth innovation? Where, which area? What? Well, I, I think it's going to continue down the path it is. I think the next really big thing is going to be that, A, we're more consistent with the use of telehealth. We'll probably have some standardization around protocols. And I think the really big evolution is going to be around how do we have those different level of staffing, licensed, non-licensed health coaches, those resources. How do we develop the right model so that we have an efficient and effective way of meeting care needs? but making sure that we have the care needs met. So having enough bodies, but having the right bodies based on the need, needs of the patients. To me, the next big step is going to be more advancements and more clarification around those things and how those non-doctors, or maybe non-mid-levels, nurses, social workers, clinical pharmacists, how do those folks participate in telehealth to do what you mentioned, which is, can I have somebody be the first catcher of this, which then escalates as needed, and can we make that a protocol? One other thing I'll say is doctors love appropriately managing their patients the way they feel they need to be managed, which means every doctor is going to have their own protocol to some extent, which is perfectly appropriate. You're the doctor. The buck does stop with you. So I think managing those, that protocol development, managing those resources, and then really getting doctors comfortable where they, they don't look at telehealth as taking over, but like you said, this is just something I add so that I don't have 64% of my patients show up and I don't, didn't add any value, and then I don't have time for the complex patients. That's where I see the next big innovation. Yeah, and I think there are probably two broad areas. One is the chronic episodic care, where you had mentioned that it was a great example of how the technology can enhance the, the patient's uh, compliance, if you will, in terms of managing that disease state. And they can do it in such a way that, um, if you will, doesn't tap the uh, resources of that local physician, but taps another resource that can actually provide them the even quicker, faster, better uh, type of uh, compliant pathway, if you will. And then the other, of course, is you always got to follow the money. And what do I <laughs> yeah. mean by that? Um, as CMS decides how they're going to reimburse for X, Y, and Z, uh, follow the money. So value-based care, uh, what, what, whether we like it, don't like it, really doesn't matter. CMS decides that, that the, the fee-for-service type of mechanism as a sole payment mechanism is going to sort of sunset over time and that it, it'll be sort of supplemented with value-based care. Then the other part of telemedicine will be, well, how, how do the doctors get paid for outcomes, not just for the process? Mm -hmm. And it's the outcome part where telemedicine, I think, will end up playing a larger role because, um, you know, to your point, if there are a million physicians and we need 1.3 million primary care physicians, that, that's going to be a problem in trying to satisfy that, that demand. So I think this is where um, telemedicine can help the patients and, and looking at and monitoring and reaching out and engaging the patient to make sure that all those heatest measures, if you will, that are required under the value-based care system uh, get addressed and measured and what have you. And so I think that that's what we're going to see the other application uh, continue to evolve. It's a, good, it's a good statement you made, follow the money. I think that's, generally speaking, when you want to look at where the future is going to go, you have to follow the money. 
right? And the money right now is moving towards more capitation, is moving towards right. more at risk, is is moving to value-based care or some form thereof. You know, when, when we've looked at the programs that we have and we're able to do interventions, on-site interventions, whether that's a telehealth intervention, that's, an, that's a physical on-site intervention, the rates of reduction in your escalations of care, uh, hospitalizations, ER admissions, is significant. You know, we, we have a, uh, one that we've done with multiple hospitals in Los Angeles, we were able to re reduce the rates of readmission by over 60% just by being able to do this treat on scene approach. Um, it's what's called kind of transitional care, transitions of care. And, uh, and so if we know for sure with, with high confidence that the ability to intervene immediately at the time of a, uh, an escalation will dramatically reduce the cost of care, then we know that that's the future. That's simply the cost. That is the future. Now, it's a question of how do you get to the point where you have enough data and you have a logistics backbone that you can intervene. So now it, it, it really becomes down to the question of, of how do I get the data? Well, that's you know a combination of diagnostics. That is, for certain types of patients, they are being automatically, they're being monitored in real time. They're being monitored on a regular basis. That's people who are, have the ability to report, self-report. Like, as an example, when we do RPM um, and we are monitoring patients, we are also surveying them. So it's not just as simple as, oh, well, I was able to get your vitals and I see that you have an escalation in your vitals. I then send a survey that says, oh, well, what did you eat today? How many bowel movements did you have today? You know, have you walked today? Have you been outside? How much water have you intaked? And, um, and so when you combine that together, you know that you have the ability to dramatically reduce care. So the, the future really is going to be that intersection between taking a, uh, a virtual approach with sufficient amount of awareness of the patient now, diagnostic information, interactions with the patient, and then baking that on top of a foundation where you can do an immediate intervention to prevent the escalation of care. And that's an extraordinarily powerful thing to think about because if so much of healthcare is built around after the escalation has happened, and now all of a sudden healthcare moves to a point where the escalation is happening dramatically less, how does that shape the entire healthcare ecosystem? What does that do to hospitals? What does that do to providers and subspecialists? What does that do to hospitalist agencies? Massive amounts of the healthcare system that are built on the patient sick always care. getting yeah, sicker. Sick care. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, other emerging you know, behavioral changes in technology is going to drive adaptation of telehealth. This is my personal opinion. Because I think if you think about it, lab. Labs, if you think about it, always we went to the lab for blood work, urine work, and other works. Imaging, we went to the labs. But with the advance of the technology, with the pandemic, showed how self-test could actually be deployed globally, right? So if you think about those kind of capabilities, so patients will have a capability to actually do the test at home and then have a telehealth visit, maybe it'd be more meaningful. So the future, I think what I, you know, uh, to put it, the under, other underlying concept of digital health, as they mature and add more data and more value and uh, insight about the patient's history, um, genetic, behavioral, social determinant of health, and all those things consolidate, I think having that value, physicians will be able to say, hey, I can see the per person's data just as if he's here on my office, right? So that is what the believing in that emerging technology and the, you know, the consolidation of the data, because as you mentioned, data could be scattered everywhere in the five Ps. So I think that the future is that as these things consolidate, the five Ps became three Ps, like right? the patient, the payer, payer, provider, pharma, and partners. As they get consolidated, it's happening already in the industry. So big, big, big companies are all merging in those five areas. As they merge, the data and the information will consolidate as well and then follow the money. So where the cost is, I think, I think that's where the value is. I think future of the telehealth market is just, we're just scratching the surface as we speak here. Right. Um, so we want, uh, in, in the interest of time, uh, we want to open up some, some questions from the audience. A couple of people coming up here. <laughs> oh, two. Keep on Don't going. Don't be shy. Come on up. Thank you. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. yeah, my name is Dr. Lisa, and I'm just so happy to hear everything you guys have to share about value-based care and where we are heading when it comes to 
Just the shortages in short in physicians is projected that by 2034 will be at 134,000 shortages in physicians. And all of you touched on something that I, it just really hit home really, really, really strongly. And I think that we are missing this great opportunity of using doctors that cannot get into residency. Right now, Arizona is requesting doctors that have taken step one and step two to work under physicians to be able to provide care to these rural areas. So um, I recently just started a program where I get these doctors and I train them in advanced value-based care services, seven of them, and they're just going with computers that are audit ready and they're helping physicians and the difference is tremendous. I get calls saying, wow, we had this person doing an RPM, but your clinicians or the people that are working for your company, they just do extraordinary well. So we have a knowledge base out there that we are ignoring. They do Uber. They're driving Uber. They're working in gas station because they don't even know that there's something like this. So I like what you guys are saying, and I hope that we start just keeping our eyes open and making use of these clinicians because, as you said, the doctors cannot be there reading all of this data, blood pressure up. They are the middle people that can go in and help these doctors to be able to provide the cost-effective quality care we need in the healthcare now. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, oh, sorry, God. Oh, no, I, wasn't saying. I was going to say, ultimately, uh, it's really quite simple. In the absence of capacity, we all fail, whether I'm a provider, whether I'm a patient, whether I'm whatever I am. Capacity is the biggest problem. This isn't about replacement. This is about intelligent assistance based on things that work, delivered in a way that makes sense. By the way, I live in a city of 102,000. I cannot find what I would define as a good doctor in my own city. I'm not rural, but I will tell you I live in a provider desert, even though I live in the city. So it's not just rural where we have this issue. It's everywhere. Great. Got another question? Hello. Tony Gittles from Orlando, Florida. You all have incredible expertise. Your careers have brought you into the healthcare system. One of my question has to do with the families, the family caregivers, and how can we incorporate more education and training to family caregivers? I took care of my mother for 14 years, sat in a hospital hours on end with no training, no contact, no information, no resources when we left. My vision is to change the healthcare system and how we interact with family caregivers. Just any thoughts or any way yeah. I can be of service yeah. to what well, you are doing. What I would say on that, on that front is that, uh, and we talked a little bit about it in one of the other sessions, is that the social determinants of health. Obviously, when someone is transitioning from a procedure or an operation back to the home, the support that they receive or don't makes a humongous difference in the outcomes. So anything that you can do to uh, embrace the support of the family in nurturing that patient when they make those transitions is critically important. And then again, you know, companies like what you do, I think, are also, in the absence of that, I, I think provide a tremendous opportunity for patients that, that just don't have that family support. Um, so, you, you know, th th there are ways to get the support that even go beyond just the family, if you will. But that is a very important aspect of, yeah. of good quality care. Thank you. We have one more question. In the Actually, I'm so oh, sorry. sorry. We are out of time, oh, guys. Okay. Yes, right. thank you so much. Please, round of applause for our panel. Thank you.